welcome back everybody to another thrilling episode of Theorycraft with myself Jack. Over in that square rectangle thing over there is Ben. You got Boris over there, the cheek like the cheeky Russian in the background. And also we got a new mascot for the channel as well, who we've not decided on a voice just yet, but we'll be getting there. And his name is named after a very delightful singer in a particular fighting film, which was rubbish. And he's called Minogi! Minogi the Koala! <laughs> but just before this video starts, why Minogi? I did not name him. <laughs> okay, folks, we have this small explanation in a previous episode. I can't remember which one, but I'm sure me or Jack will tag it eventually in the comments down below. But basically, growing up here in the UK, there was this delightful TV series known as My Parents Are Aliens. The dad, which was an alien, was unable to say the name Minogue. He was obsessed with Kylie Minogue. I could never fathom why. It was quite creepy, but again, it was late, well, late 90s, early 2000s. It's British television. Take it as you will. And for the life of me, to this day, I still say Minogi instead of Minogue. And there you go. That's the only explanation. You Kylie Minogi. <laughs> Ever since you can blame Ben for that one. So anyway, he's gone. <laughs> so once for today's subject as how to ruin a childhood. Well, that is going to be the subject of today as there's a lot of things in Disney, such as jokes which fly over your head, very dark plots, dark characters, dark origins of characters as well, and just really screwed up stories because once you become an adult, the magic disappears or will scar you and later on scar your children and also the grandchildren as well. So without further ado, let's get ready to have your childhood completely wrecked forever by myself, Jack, and then over in the other rectangle. So where do we start from here? Let's get ready to rant. So oh, yes. One, which we have to get on to. I have to get this one out of the way. Is we got to talk about how one of my favorite Disney films of all time, which I always love, but now ever since a particular video which I saw flying around on TikTok, I will never watch Lion King the same way ever again. I will never <laughs> watch this thing ever again. So, yes, we are talking about The Lion King. Lion King has been a namesake for the 90s worth of Disney movies. I think it was probably one of the highest rating Disney movies at the time. One of the most successful ones, yeah. Yes. And to a degree, it is sort of based on the idea of Shakespeare's Hamlet. But yes, indeed. There are some very deep and disturbing things within the whole scope of the story. Primarily, what happens to Simba's dad? Well, yeah, now, obviously, we know we know the whole long live the king thing. <laughs> when he falls down into the gorge, it can lay his body, dead. Simba comes across him. He gets chased out into the desert by the hyenas. And that's the end of it. We never see Mufasa again. We never see his body. Nothing like that. And the reason why we're going to get into this, obviously, they're not going to really show this in a kid's film. But there's a particular detail which was not picked out by me. I wish I could remember this TikToker's name, but I can't. But there's a particular scene where he's asking Zazu, the, he's asking Zazu the um, what kind of, is he like a macaw? What kind of? No, Taku. Taku. Uh... What kind of bird is he again? Takoon, uh, I don't know if it's how you pronounce it. It's, it's a very obscure bird. Um, uh, no, I don't think it's even that. I can't even remember. I think it's like a weird amalgamation of other birds in between because it never looks like anything I've ever seen. Well, anyway, like that, like Scar, and the brother of Mufasa, is asking Zazu to sing him a song. And when he's singing this song, saying, I've got a bubbly bunch of coconuts and I won't sing the rest of the song because of copyright. Um, but as he's singing the song, you see Scar, he's playing with a lion skull. And this is where Lion King was ruined for me. As with hyenas, yes, they're scavengers, they can be occasional predators. But I don't think there's anything to suggest, even for the real world, that they actually eat lions. But it's very common among lions 
especially among other prides, as males when a rival male comes in, which the fact that there's two males doesn't really make sense, sometimes happens, but the fact that we never see Mufasa's body again, it's in Scar's bedroom, to give or take, lounge wire, and he's playing with the thing, and it's quite common for lions, especially when they're going to kill the young of the previous male as well, to captain lie to, in some cases, cannibalize. So it makes me wonder, did Scar actually eat Mufasa? <laughs> did he eat I mean, his own brother? <laughs> I mean, that would be... It's a very disturbing thought, but yet it's the only most logical thought because you do see the body after it's been stampeded, but then nothing else. Like, Obviously, yeah. after that point, he Simba goes like running away because he gets shunned. I think it's by Mufasa, if not by the hyenas. He gets scared away. Yeah, and then told, yeah, he gets told by Scar to run and never return, and then he tells the hyenas to go and kill him. Yes, and that's it. Like you don't see much else, obviously, because it's a kids movie, but it's heavily implied and. To be fair, it would make a lot of sense because, well, he wanted to be the one in charge, so obviously trying to get rid of the evidence as best you can, it's the only way of doing it. And just the thing, when Zazu is in that little cage, literally a rib cage, he might be inside the torso of Mufasa. Uh, well. Has this ruined Lion King for you yet, kiddies? It's rather ribbing. Uh, <laughs> But, <laughs> but no, I mean, this is why we wanted to do this chat because Disney has got dark details. Well, this thing, the irony being is that Disney, whenever a childhood movie has been made, it's been loosely made off prior ideas like the Green Fairy Book Tales or whatever, and it gets Disney fired, which makes it kid friendly. However, there are times that it happily sneaks in under the rugs and we don't realize till years later and there's a lot of moments where i wonder how the hell did they even get away with it especially now with disney plus they have had to alter a lot of old school stuff which one i found absolutely hilarious was that there was a very old uh cartoon of donald duck as a um count he, count, was it count was that count duckula no donald du count duckula is something else entirely oh yeah sorry yeah um uh, donald dunk uh, not donald but donald <laughs> <Duck>. <laughs> let's, let's, donald let me see that <laughs> donald duck is part of i believe the boy scouts there's a scene where he's in a cabin and he's wearing oh. like a boy scouts outfit but i don't guess like what the... where this is going oh no 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 it gets worse so he has a book in his hand guess what it says on it and guess what's on it mine camp yeah and it has the swastika logo on it and i'm just like oh god like disney yes we know you were german but Christ, I know, Just... I know. And there was one. Well, there's a few which, which one of them you pointed out to me, even though I already knew of it, but I forgot about it. But it's one for the first from the no, one of them is from the second Toy Story. The other one's from the first one. The second one, the one that we're all familiar with, kids will remember it, adults remember it. This one flies straight over kids' heads, but for the adults, it obviously means something else so i'm going to try and keep this as pg as possible as i don't want to get uh my teeth kicked in by the youtube police so jet and so obviously the cowgirl jesse goes around like on that hot wheels track because to let the dog out lands on the doorknob opens up the door dog goes out and you see buzz goes ching, ching. with the wings which for the kids then they'll think oh buzz thought that was really cool and to the adults they go oh. <laughs> well the other thing I pointed out... you know what that means from yes. the male part? <laughs> yes. But the other thing that I pointed out to Jack, which I found out, I think it was via Tumblr or an Instagram post many years ago. So in the very first Toy Story movie, there's the Frankenstein toys that Sid makes out of just random parts. And there's one where it's a fishing 
uh, rod and barbie legs. Now, someone cleverly realised that that is actually a pun on words to be a hooker. <laughs> I kid you not, this is in a kid's movie. This is the first ever Pixar movie. And they got away with that as a kid's joke. I I don't understand how. Like, you look back on it, you're like, yeah, okay, yeah. But it's just like, why? Like, wh who was it going to benefit? Because the kids just like, hmm? But for the grown-ups, it, again, it'd be, hmm? Until someone pointed it out. Because I just thought it was just like him being psychotic. But again, it's a hooker. But there we go. <laughs> Yeah, there was another one in staying in the Toy Story universe. There was another one. I it was in number three where um, there's Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head, and one of the other toys takes Mrs. Potato Head's mouth, and Mr. Potato Head, which this should be obvious to all the adults, says, "Nobody t takes my wife's mouth but me," which obviously you know what that means. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we're trying to be PG as best we can, folks. We can't go but... into too much detail, really. <laughs> no, no, but let's just say it was a bit some sort of lip service. Uh... <laughs> um, <laughs> behave, <laughs> but staying with Toy Story, another quite dark thing within that movie, the third one at least, is where they're in the trash compactor in the incinerator and they're all just holding hands. Like that's really dark and twisted. I know. Even like I even I was watching that thinking, oh my god, the comparison. This is like a crematorium for toys. Well, I would argue maybe a bit worse. Like going with the fact that Walt Disney I being know, German, German and I know where you're going. Yeah, I'm not saying anything YouTube honest. I is innocent, I is an angel of sorts, even though I'm not actually Christian. All I'm gonna say is that it starts with A and that's it. Yes. Um, but yes. It's definitely a very traumatic scene regardless, but it's one of those things where I I always wonder why do they have scenes like that for a kids movie like is it just a way of preparing kids mentally that not everything is sunshine and rainbows or is it just for the fact that we just want to screw up as many kids as possible i i i don't know but then again i think it's in a way it's very cleverly done so they can get it past but it's just like only it's only now we're in the year 2021 but it's around like this kind of time where parents who never had a problem with these films before now 20 so years later have now got a problem with it because now other people are pointing out the things wrong with it and only just trying to complain now well, there's nothing you can do about it now because it's 20 years no. later but another one is one that i found a little while ago which is in emperor's new group which is a fantastic film and i think it's really underrated because i think it's brilliant mm -hmm. uh where the emperor gets Cusco gets turned into a llama a talking llama Here's a llama, there's a llama, llama, llama duck. <laughs> so we have like that scene when like Kronk where he's basically the way he's having I think the I can't remember who he's talking to or if he's talking to himself, but he's basically talking about pitching a tent. Now that flies straight over kids' heads because they think, <laughs> oh he's literally gonna pitch up a real tent. But obviously to us adults we know what pitching a tent means. Don't think we need to explain any further. But no. and then you see him in the very next scene, and he's sleeping with a. Well, I feel with a little. He's sleeping on the floor, but he's only got the tent over his junk. Crown jewels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, this is one movie. There's been a lot of uh, kids' movies being made into live adaptations. It hasn't been well received so far, but I think Emperor's New Groove is probably going to be the one that hopefully saves it because it's just going to be so obscure and i just hope that they bring back the same actor as kronk because his voice for kronk just makes sense oh i can't remember who the actor was uh i know it's the same guy that plays joe swanson in family guy and he's done a lot of other things he's quite a tall guy anyway so he's the right build for kronk it's the voice for me is the fact that he's so slow speaking and so deep that it sounds really stupid already like it's a man version of a blonde if that makes sense yeah 
I don't know why. That's just reminded me of just reminded me of Aladdin. Actually, I can't remember why. Well, what was happening in the scene at the time between uh, Princess Jasmine and thing in my Bob's name? What's his freaking name? Jafar. Yeah. And, like, something's happening in the scene. I can't remember what, but there's a particular line that's said by, I think, a civilian or something like that in the film. Or was it maybe by the genie? I can't even really remember because I've only ever seen the film once in my lifetime. But there's a particular line where he says, uh, when they're kind of getting a little bit freaky or whatever, not in that way in the film, but they get a little bit freaky. And one of them says out loud, I thought the world wasn't supposed to shake until the honeymoon. <laughs> See, no, that's the second movie. Um... It's, I think it's the second movie. It's basically the genie remarks the idea of earthquakes, and that's why he says what he says. I think it's because I don't know if it's actually a TV series because there was a TV series, there was also a second movie in the original movie. Because the book itself, there is a lot more than just the genie, it's a very complicated book, but I think it's in the cartoon series, yeah. Um. I saw the picture of it the other day and I completely forgot about that as well. Like, these are the things that we wanted to discuss is like the underlying adult jokes that just went um, just straight over our heads as kids because we just didn't know any better. But as you grow up, you just go, huh? Yeah. And then when you, when you think of things such as Pinocchio, all I'm going to say is Pinocchio. It's not exactly hard to guess what that represents, but... <laughs> Well, well, Pinocchio... it's bit, well, well, it's well, it's not really hard to guess, but it is hard. <laughs> well, the thing is, the whole concept of Pinocchio is quite a. Even if it wasn't a Disney thing, because it's based on books, as is everything, it's quite a dodgy concept that an old man makes a wooden boy and wishes him to come to life, and that it's like family guy did do a joke on it years and years ago when family guy first came about and it does make me laugh that it it took them to imply that that's the reason why he exists i'm not saying anything because youtube eyes is good or is honestly good um but it's one of those things of many things with pinocchio how traumatizing that movie was Let's just skim over the idea that Geppetto is like a very creepy old guy that makes the wooden Pinocchio doll. Let's just skim over that. The fact that there is a child molester that's running a circus that turns them all into donkeys, just to make an ass out of them, and basically uses them as entertainment for the circus, At the towards the end of the movie... They all get freed, but they don't get turned back into the kids that they were, but they can speak. So these kids instinctively run home. That's going to creep the hell out of the parents hearing uh, their child's voice coming out of a... Well, I suppose, to be fair, most kids are asses anyway. But there we go. Yeah. Well, actually, now you said donkey, that just reminded me of Shrek, actually, because I never, even as an adult, I never noticed this before until I think you pointed it out to me where it's when you said, Jack, you remember that scene at the beginning, you know, where like all the animals and like all the different like freaks are all in cages and everything like that. And you see like the baby bears in a separate one. You got the mother bear and the daddy bear that's in another cage. And the scheme and the whole movie skips ahead to about an hour, so we don't. So they might must have been sold off at some point, and you see like the very same bow that was in the mo mother bear's fur is the same one that's on Lord Farquaad's floor. Yes, I mean the thing I love most of all is that Shrek, the very first one at least, wasn't technically intended to be a kids' movie because it was designed by Mike Myers. Everything he does is a He's the piss take. Take the piss. <laughs> yeah, it was basically taking the mick out of Disney. And so the first movie had lots of like sexual and adult themed jokes I mean, to it. I mean, for God's sake, like, uh, it, it's, even though it was like so obvious, but like Lord Farquaad, if you yes. say that to yourself over and over again, what does it sound like? <laughs> yeah, we're not saying it here in case that YouTube goes. Lord F Wad. <laughs> yes. But there are, there's the bits where, like, obviously, 
when you got the music box, if you remember, where like they got the weird puppetry things that sing and like they imply certain things, which again is oh yeah, shine shine your sho shoes, wipe your wipe your face. face. It's yeah, I mean Shrek got away with a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the biggest mystery to that entire movie, let alone the fact that it had four movies, if not five, I think. Oh, I lost the... track after like three. <laughs> I have still couldn't fathom my head around how a donkey and a dragon did the Iggy Biggy. Yeah, because like you had those baby dragon donkey hybrid things. How? I mean, would you call would you call them a dranky or a doggen? Well, I, I prefer dranky actually. I quite like that. I mean, baby that just drank. sounds something an Irishman would say. Really, is a dranky? Drank, uh, look, we're going down the pub for a dranky. <laughs> Um, but yes, I mean, there's a lot of things within Pinocchio that is just beyond bonkers. But then the other thing as well is that I'd say the what the Disney movies that have a lot more magic to it are the ones that have the most screwy side to it all. Mostly Beauty and the Beast. I'm looking forward because, to this one. <laughs> well, so the thing is. The logic is that he had to basically find a way of redeeming himself before his 21st birthday. And they said that it was 11 years that they were trapped in the forms that they were. Now, that would mean that he was, bare, well, around 10 years old when he was first cursed, okay? That in itself is beyond screwy. A 10 year old being cursed into being a monstrous, like, thing. But. Obviously, all the servants, all the people, everyone that worked in the house was trapped in their various forms, including Chip, who was a teacup. He was 10 when he became a kid again, which means he was only a baby when he was turned into a teacup. Bloody hell. Exactly. But <sighs> let's move over the fact that Beauty and the Beast is literally Stockholm Syndrome, okay? Like, there is no other way of listing it. It is literally no. Stockholm Syndrome. We can argue the fact that Gaston is a misogynist piece of poop. But there's also, in the newer movie, which I find really cringy, at the end of the movie, the guy that plays the prince that transforms back... He and Belle have a dance around the ball as they've either just been married or something... And they imply about the honeymoon, and he growls like the beast, which is like, yeah, like what Disney? Why? Why would you apply something that? That's just but, yeah. Even though the adults like, right, you know what he's gonna do, you know what they're gonna do. Everybody knows. You don't have to. <laughs> but the other thing I'm wondering as well, right, is obviously Chip is a teacup and he has a piece of him missing as a teacup oh, i'm no. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no stick I with just me worked it out. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah yeah no 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 it's not even that obviously when he turns into a human that piece is still missing so would that mean he's brain damaged to a degree because it's on the very top like above his eye so it's going to be like a around... like that's oh. really because then the other thing as well is like that random piece of chip must be turned back afterwards so that you've got like a brand. Yes. <laughs> this is why this is a subject that I was really looking forward to because it makes me question how too much or extent of this curse did get undone. Because the logic obviously is the fact that they wouldn't have had. I don't know whether or not they would have had to refurbish everything afterwards because technically all the staff and everything was the furniture yeah. or whether they got fused with the furniture and then they got separated from it afterwards. Good, good question. I don't really know. I, I mean, given the fact that he is a prince, he could probably afford, afford that going to like whatever the Renaissance version of Ikea was, but... <laughs> Well, it probably, well, probably IKEA would have existed then. It's been around long enough. Um, but Beauty and the Beast is probably a very bizarre movie in itself because it's all about like 
female independence. It's about proving that she don't need no man. And then by the end of the movie, she need that man. Yeah, it even <laughs> though it's, it's Stockholm Syndrome. It's not a love story. Yes, no, I completely agree on that. But it's the fact that it completely counterfacts itself by like the last quarter of the movie that she proved time and time again that she didn't need any man because she was smart and intelligent enough, which back in those days would be deemed enough to put be put on a burning stake and be labelled as a witch, which I'm pretty sure Gaston tried doing in that movie because he sent her father to an insane asylum because of being a crackpot. But again, it's... It's a very odd movie, looking back on it as an adult. The only thing that I could technically agree on is the fact that it promotes the idea that it's not about how you look on the outside, it's about who you are on the inside, but it's a very... I mean, the message is good, the message is good, but... Yes, but it's not a very clear message, which, again, I think could have been done better. Yeah, although... Just when we, but just before we start this thing, you were talking about another, like some more dark stuff, which I have not actually really heard much about. But you were talking about Dumbo, I think. Earlier. Yes. Um, so Dumbo is a very well. It doesn't technically have a happy ending, despite what we think. So the whole point is that Dumbo is obviously an infant elephant that was born into the circus, which means very bad and crappy situations because it's a circus like back then it was work the animals to death this was before the days where people had animal rights and all this bits and bobs in between the fact that he's labeled dumbo because of his massive ears because he looks dumb which is kind of harsh and like at the end of the, the entire movie it's basically because he has such massive ears and he learns how to fly with them it attracts more people interested in the circus. The only upside is the fact that because he generates so much income for the circus, him and his mum get a bigger cage in the circus. That's it. That's how the movie ends. That's like they not don't get... a happy ending. No, this is it. Like Everyone thinks that... D I love the old movies, don't get me wrong, but it's not a happy ending like everyone thinks it is because it just... I mean, granted, this was 1941, so it's quite a dark time anyway but again it's one of those things where the only happy ending is that they got slightly better living accommodation that was it uh, it's just it's like what else can you add to it well then we're uh, going into like obviously since we're going into the kids side of things something which is super obvious when you're an adult when you're a kid you don't think about it how dark tom and jerry was well, I mean, there's a lot of things of I old mean, school cartoons is, that. I mean, there is a lot of. Um, if you really look into it, there's a particular there's a particular episode where Tom and Jerry develop depression, and then yes. they both, and then I think Tom lays on the train train tracks and tries to kill himself, and then I think Jerry joins him, but then I think something happens; they don't end up getting run over, but. Eventually, they both end up suffering from depression. And if you really look into this episode, it's really friggin' dark. <laughs> yeah, well, there's another one which is quite disturbing as well, uh, which is All Dogs Go to Heaven. Have you ever seen that movie? Mm. This I think it's all, <laughs> I think it's All Dogs Go to Heaven. So, obviously, the main dog doesn't want to go. He wants to stay on Earth. But there is a scene... I can't remember if it's this movie or something else entirely, but as they're like all these creatures are queuing up to go through the pearly gates, there's a random sack that's jumping up and down in the queue. As it gets to the altar, it's a sack of kittens. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me, but like, uh, like the if if none of you like are none the wise. Work it out, forgot it. Work it. Well, out. the the worst bit is like the sack of kittens. Obviously, the sack is still sopping wet because it opens up and it just goes. Splack. No, no. And it's just like Jesus, no. fudging hell. I mean, 
That's not how you go, oh, fucking, let me go figure it yeah. out. Yeah. I mean, there are some dark puns within movies that work out quite well. Like, towards the end of Lion King, Zazu asks Simba, who's now a full-fledged pride lion, what are you going to do with him, sire? He'd make a quite nice throw rug. And he goes, hmm, maybe he will. Shrug it off. Come along to Hercules. And he's in his, like, training face. And yes! he's in his room. And the, the weird little guy that's training him throws him a towel but it's not a towel it's um his well it's the lion that's been turned into a throw and rug it looks identical to scar yes down to the absolute t with the scar over his eye which, um, like, there's that theory which like all the films are somehow connected in some way <laughs> yeah i mean I'm never fully sure on the whole Disney theory because everyone's been speculating ever since Pixar came along that it's all intertwined. Whether or not it is, it'd be interesting, but I highly doubt it because it's hard to try and put everything in together. Although if you although if you look at a really dark film like Monsters, Inc., which basically all the concept of the film is about is a load of monsters giving kids PTSD. Oh, no, no, it gets worse than that, because by the end of the movie, at least, like, the original idea is, like, they scare kids, they use the energy. Traumatising kids, okay, like, scaring, that's not too bad, because most kids have the fear of monsters, and they get over it to a degree as they get older. But it's the fact that towards the end of the movie, they change their tactics as a way of making them laugh. That's going to traumatise them more, surely, psychologically. If you were hearing a kid randomly laugh in the middle of the night, you'd think they were possessed by like some antichrist demon or something. Christ. <laughs> like, it's not natural to hear a kid just randomly laugh in the middle of the night. If you hear them scream, that's fair enough because it's night, Travers. But how can you you try and logically hear a kid say, oh, no, it, I wasn't scared by a monster. I just heard a monster do a, com a comedy routine and then eat a microphone and belch it up. Yeah. You logic, like, how do you explain that without being psychotic? Oh, there's another, there's another animated dis, animated Disney film which I cannot remember its bloody name. It's about these, I think it's about these germs or whatever these colourful things that exist inside someone's body. I think I can't. Inside remember. Out. Inside Out. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. And there's a particular. Well, in, in, there's a particular thing in Inside Out where I think they're looking at some of the inhabitants of San Francisco, which obviously in America. So they're one of them. They're, I think a load of them are checking out some of the inhabitants, the humans of San Francisco and everything. And one of them points out a big, like a big hairy man. And another one ends up remarking, oh, that's a man. I thought it was a bear. And... San Francisco has a really big gay community, which mm. like big but like big burly hairy like men in the gay community are called bears. So that's what <laughs> that means. Now you know. <laughs> yes, the more you know. Uh, <laughs> the more you know, the more you never want to see it again. Definitely. I mean we could probably spend God knows how long debating how dark and twisted Disney is. But at the end of the day, I think Disney's never going to stop making movies regardless. It just depends on how far they push, because there are some things where I'm going to have to re-watch some stuff. I mean, you've got one of the newer movies, I think it's um, called Soul, where it basically talks about the idea of death and, like, idea of what life and whatever it is meant to be which is a fair enough idea but then it comes into question as to how meaningless life is because they make it out like you don't really you choose what you want from here but at the end of the day you just come back here which is quite a depressive way of like equating what life is all about that you just choose random things and then come back uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, there are so many things that Disney has tried its best to try and explain in a better way for kids to understand. Inside Out is probably a very good explanation in terms of how to explain what emotions are, because 
it has helped kids at least at a very early age if they got autism or something that they don't fully comprehend what an emotion is yeah they can show what the character i keep hitting my mic uh what a character from that film they associate with and i don't think disney's ever going to stop with making films for kids obviously but it does beg the question as to how far is too far i mean i think well if it ha if the limit hasn't been reached by now it will be reached at some point because if you get to the point of where well, i think especially when it comes to these films if you get to the point where you can get away with something for so long then gradually over time you're going to keep doing it you're going to keep up in the ante especially with these tongue-in-cheek sort of jokes or references you're going to see eventually they're going to want to see how far they can go with it well the thing that i just clocked about um beauty and the beast as well is lumiere's little thing on the site that i don't know if it's his girlfriend or what but it's the feather duster which turns out to be a french maid <laughs> yeah like I wonder whether a lot of people fantasize that as a certain thing for you know what because of that movie because it's it's these little things that you look back on you think hmm I wonder if that sort of inspired something along the way like <sighs> there are so many things about Disney that just I'm surprised they get away with to this day and then the irony being that they have so many properties now that they get taken the mick out of, but it's like, who cares? Like, we make money and we'll probably use it to the end of time. Yeah, which obviously we were sticking to the old Disney because everything that's owned by Disney, like Star Wars, Marvel, and all that, that doesn't count. So No. No. But is there anything else you want to add to today's talk? But my 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 favorite one is still about shrek you know lord farquad which say that over and over again you'll gradually work out what it means <laughs> yeah i mean to be fair shrek is owned by dreamworks so it's not a disney property but it is taking the mick out of disney uh i mean it's just what? how successful shrek was wasn't actually meant to happen which i found funny <laughs> yeah well this is it i mean there's also like Old Yeller, like that's a Disney property. Do we need to say more? Like really. it's quite Painted a traumatic movie. <laughs> and also another one which, if you watch it as an adult, is actually a traumatizing film, The Fox and the Hound. Yeah, I was just coming to that. I was just looking on my list, and it's like so you got a fox and a hound that come best of buddies. Like animals don't live as long as us, so you would imagine they wouldn't be able to forget that much. But it's quite a traumatic turn of events. But it's also trying to figure out, I'd argue in a way, it's kind of like how America views certain races of people, because obviously America being quite a racist country, you can see where I'm going with this, where like kids, when you're kids, like you don't see color, you don't see race, you don't see anything, you just see another human. It's all bliss. If you make friends, you make friends. If you don't, you don't. But as you get older, you get influenced by certain people and told certain things. And thus, that's pretty much how that film works to a degree. And the way so that I'm going to destroy one, I'm going to destroy Dee's favourite film. I'm going to I'm going to ruin Pocahontas for a lot of you. Because oh, Pocahontas, man. the real story of Pocahontas, is that it's like a very really nice love story and everything. The film... The majority of it is actually fiction. It's mm -hmm. not actually true because the real story of Pocahontas is just cringeworthy because Ugh. the way she is depicted in the film is that she's an adult where in reality she was actually maybe like 13 or 14. He was in his 30s. Mm -hmm. So al already that... Yeah. Well, the thing is I know the true ending to Pocahontas is that she died in the River Thames from hypothermia. Yes, like that's the that's the most terrifying part of the entire thing of Pocahontas is that she basically got taken away from her homeland, taken to England as a way of showing her off because she was shown off to like various hierarchies in London because of John Smith, yeah, and basically died of her hypothermia and that was it. Yes, uh, the real story of Pocahontas is actually freaking depressing. 
I think as well, from what I remember of things that I've read, is that she did actually um, get pregnant by him, but she, uh, but the baby obviously didn't survive. So, given the, t I mean, it's what seventeen hundreds or sixteen hundreds, also it's something a bit earlier than that. Mm, I think around. I think it was the. I can't remember exactly. I think it was the mid seventeen hundreds. Yeah. So obviously they didn't have the same medical scope as we do now in terms of dealing with something like that. So again, it's even more traumatic of what medical procedures she would have had to go through if that was a true case. It's just this poor girl did nothing but just get a bit too curious for her own good, and just subsequently had her life shortened yeah so yeah because in reality she died extremely young mm -hmm. but now it... there's actually a memorial of her in london i believe oh no there is. Well, it may not be i can't remember where exactly it is it, i think there's one in london and i think there's one in america where like she used to come from where like the colonial the well, john smith's people went to in the first place but it's just a very weird take on how drastically Disney-fied a historic moment could happen. Because, like, you wouldn't do it to any other historic moment in history, like the Titanic or any other, like, cataclysmic, earth-changing moment. But yet Pocahontas was completely romanticised. And while it was a great movie and there was a sequel... The only thing that made sense was the fact that John Smith went over to America and he met her. That's the only consistency. The rest of it, nothing. Like, no, like ninety percent of that film is pure fiction. Well, I mean, it's Disney. They have liberties in terms of making things a bit more happy, smiley, because it's the happiest place on earth, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> even though the actual guy Walt Disney himself was not always a very nice bloke. <laughs> no. But... I've heard a few stories when I've been watching uh, a few documentaries and so on on Walt Disney that apparently he was a wife batterer, I think, and a bit of an alcoholic as well. Whether that's yeah. actually true, I don't know. But <sighs> Who knows? I mean, it was different times regardless. It's not something I condone, but again, it's just different times. We can't fully understand the logic but there we go any other so this, uh, this has been the talk on the house of mouse so, oh yes uh, i've actually thoroughly enjoyed this i've been looking forward to getting this one out and i think now you lot are never going to look at disney the same way ever again <laughs> yes i think we've well and truly traumatized them for a little while which means we're going to take a bit of a break for about a week because we both need a bit of a sh break from chaos that's going on in the world but we will be back eventually it will be my topic next time Which and is... i want to cover one of my favorite 80s movies that has been talked about as a sequel recently which i'm trying to fathom how they're going to do it but it is labyrinth a really great movie that had david bowie in it's a very bizarre movie it was absolutely bonkers and apparently there's a sequel in the works, which is going to have Jennifer Connelly back. But the problem being that David Bowie is no longer with us. And she's Can't like in her late 40s now? Yes. But then to be fair, like most Hollywood people, they seem to stop aging after 25 if you got enough Botox and money. <laughs> yeah, personally, this film, even all this time later, I still don't get it. And... And... Ben knows. He, he hates me for the fact I don't like David Bowie's music. <sighs> I, I don't. I'm sorry. No, nah, it's fair enough, but it's friggin', just one of my... Friggin' fight me! <laughs> Give it time. I'm working on my sword and my weapons. <laughs> but yes, my all-time... Well, one of my all-time favourite 80s movies is Labyrinth. Not only does it have David Bowie, who sang throughout most of the film is part of the movie itself 
The actual puppetry behind it all is done by Jim Henson, the guy that did Sesame Street, Star Wars, and Muppets. Oh, yeah, he did, didn't he? Yeah, he is the master of all Muppets and puppets within Hollywood, to be fair. There is a lot of traumatising moments in the movie, but it is definitely a movie that I would love to see either done as a sequel or redone in modern day to see how much more spooky it could be. But there we go. That's my topic for next time. Again, thanks for watching us, folks. We are two dudes and now two very little guys that like to rant, rave and Where'd ramble. Oh, that's his butt. <laughs> I was going to say he's the right way up now. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we have Boris in the for very background and we have Minogi in the foreground. Quality. So again, thanks for joining us, folks. We are two dudes that rant, rave, and ramble all things sci-fi, comic book, or just movie lore gone by. And again, stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you all soon. Yeah.